Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, Ream Library and the, the Michael C. McFarland SJ Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Um, I'm Tom Landy. I direct the center, and one of the really great parts of my job is that I get to host the Jesuits who are who come to Holy Cross under the aegis of our International Visiting Jesuit Fellows Program. Some of you have met Father George Pateri in the back, one of the two Jesuits who's teaching in Religious Studies Department uh, this semester, and he spoke uh, uh, about a month ago to us. Today I'm pleased to introduce another Jesuit who's been teaching this semester in Sociology and Anthropology, uh, is Father Francis Brito, SJ. Francis is a Jesuit from Tamil Nadu in India who has lived and worked in Japan since 1973 with little time off for studies, including a doctorate at Georgetown University in studies and sabbaticals in Spain, Ireland, and England. He's a professor at Sofia University in Tokyo, the famous Jesuit university in Japan. Father Brito is a sociolinguist. Sociolinguist, I started to say sociolinguistic. Father Brito is a sociolinguist, and he's teaching a course on that topic here at Holy Cross. He's a man of wide learning and interests who's published interesting work in his own field and more broadly. He's certainly one of the more computer literate Jesuits who's come to the uh, Visiting Jesuit Fellow Program so far. His talk to us today, Are We All Hindus Now?, draws connections between current trends in Christianity in America and in the developed world and the tenets of Hinduism. Please join me in welcoming Father Brito. In the August 2009 issue of Newsweek, Lisa Miller, the religion editor wrote a feature provocatively entitled, We Are All Hindus Now. Some of you may have read it. Anybody who has read it? It was in 2009. What she said, recent poll data show, she observed, that conceptually at least, we, she means primarily Americans, are slowly becoming more like Hindus and less like traditional Christians in the ways we think about God, ourselves, each other, and eternity. She does not mean that Americans are rushing to the Ganges to wash away their sins or letting loose the cows to roam about on highways. Rather, she contends that Christians are giving up many of their faith claims and adopting trends long sponsored by Hindus. The instant I saw the title of the article, I said to myself, there, here is someone who thinks just like me. <laughs> As one brought up in India and taught first to look down upon Hinduism in the pre-Vatican era, then to look up to it in the post-Vatican era, I have frequently felt that the Catholic population, together with the rest of the world, was adopting, mostly unawares, a theological outlook similar to that of the Hindus. The first time it dawned on me was when the church, after the Second, Second Vatican Council, took a conciliatory rather than a confrontational stance toward other religions. We in India had been taught that Catholicism was the only true religion superior to all Hindu superstitions, that belief in rebirth was irrational, and that idolatry and cremation were gravely sinful and against the true faith. Yet. In our Indian secular literature, which we studied in school, the Hindu leaders like Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and Mahatma Gandhi were celebrated for their magnanimity and openness towards other religions. None of the Hindus we knew ever made claims to Hinduism being the only means of salvation, and none belittled Christianity either as unfortunately some Hindu fanatics do today. On the contrary, the Hindus always told us that there was only one God, and it did not matter under what name or what form God was worshipped. Then in 1965, 
when Pope Paul VI promulgated the declaration, Nostra Aetate, I felt that at last the Catholic Church was vindicating Hindu nobility by showing similar respect for other religions. Although to Christians the declaration seemed a revolutionary and novel breakthrough, to Indians it seemed nothing but the Christian reinvention of an ancient Hindu wheel. The new face of Christianity. Miller presents four conspicuous changes in American religious life as indicative of the slide towards Hinduism. One, American Catholics have increasingly come to, ex American Christians rather, not only Catholics, have increasingly come to accept that their religion is not the only true religion and that other religions too can be true and salvific. Two, increasingly Americans ignore the teachings of their own religious authorities and go shopping for spiritual goods to gurus of different religions and philosophies as if they are all the same. Three, although traditionally Americans abhorred reincarnation, now 24% assert their belief in it. Despite their long-held opposition to cremation, Americans now increasingly opt for it. The National Funeral Directors Association, NFDA, reports that as of 2008, more than 30% of the dead were cremated. And they predict that more than 50% of the dead will be cremated by 2025. Part of the reason may be economic. The NFDA reported a 78% jump from 2007 to 2008 for requests for cremation, which is generally several thousand dollars cheaper than burial. As all these trends novel to Christians have been the general norm among the Hindus, for centuries Miller contends that Americans are becoming Hindus. Much of the statistical data in support of Miller's argument comes from the Pew Forum reports based largely on the U.S. Religious Landscape Survey. Similar data are available also for various European countries which are generally even less religious than the United States. The Pew Forum reports reveal that although most Americans, 88%, believe in God or a universal spirit, only 24% maintain that my religion is the one true faith leading to eternal life. And 70% maintain that many religions can lead to eternal life. Among the major Christian churches, Catholics are second lowest, 19%, in the rank of those who say, there is only one way to interpret the teachings of my religion. And second highest, 77%, in the rank of those who say, there is more than one true way to interpret the teachings of my religion. Given that even nationally, 27% answer, there is only one way, and 68% answer, there are many ways, Catholics are notably more open than others to accept a variety of interpretations to what their church teaches. Briefly then, even though there are still many who claim they are Christians, their interpretation of Christianity is nowhere near the official version, but edges closer and closer to Hinduism, both in the acceptance of other religions and in the pick and choose attitude towards the teachings of their own authorities. Dean Hoagie, the late Catholic sociologist, observed similar trends in his survey done several years earlier. In Woodstock Conversations, he writes, the boundaries of the faith are weak right now. 
there is, this is a problem area. For example, in our nationwide survey in 2003, we asked Catholics of each generation whether they agreed with statements such as, if you believe in God, it doesn't matter which religion you belong to, overwhelming numbers of each generation, including 91% of young adult Catholics, agreed with that particular statement. In another study reported in American Catholics Today, New Realities of Their Faith and Their Church, when Catholic informants were asked whether they would consider a person good Catholic, even if he or she disobeyed Christ's church's teachings on such issues as marriage and divorce, birth control, and attending mass on Sundays, more than 60% replied in the affirmative. Even what it means to be a Catholic seems to be a question too academic and confusing to the contemporary young generation. After engaging with Catholic youth at Woodstock 2000 Forum entitled Young Adult Catholics Believing, Belonging, and Serving, one of the priests exclaimed, I hear the youth asking the church to make herself clear on the basics. What do you mean when you say Jesus Christ is the Son of God? What do you mean when you say the Eucharist is the body of Christ? How is it the body of Christ? How are we the body of Christ? One of the student participants in the forum said, as many a Hindu might say, that she was not really into formal prayer. But I talked to God a lot. I talked to him like he was right there. The students focus on God rather than Jesus Christ or the Virgin Mary. And her confidence in talking to God informally and everywhere, using her own words rather than the rosary or the Our Father, is worth observing. Another trend that the surveys indicate is that many Americans change their religious affiliation as a matter of course, and even repeatedly. According to the Pew Forum, half of Americans, adults, have changed their religion at least once. Half of Americans. Most people who change their religion leave their childhood faith before age 24. And many of those who change religion do so more than once. As regards Catholics, the same report says, Catholicism has suffered the greatest net loss in the process of religious change. Many people who leave the Catholic Church do so for religious reasons. Two-thirds of former Catholics who have become unaffiliated say they left the church, faith, they left the Catholic faith because they stopped believing in its teachings, as do half of former Catholics who are now Protestant. Are we all Hindus then? One may wonder why Miller chose to call these current trends a sign of Hinduism than, say, secularism, New Age, or Buddhism. Critics of liberal Christianity generally dismiss the current trends as, as secularism or New Age. And the Hindu features Miller points out, such as the acceptance of other religions, belief in reincarnation and the practice of cremation are to be found not only in Hinduism, but also in Buddhism. No doubt, all these labels may seem applicable, but several reasons justify calling the current trends Hinduism, perhaps anonymous Hinduism, rather than anything else. Secularism is not the most appropriate term since the overwhelming majority of Americans are still religious. They believe in God, they pray, and they believe in afterlife. New age is too fuzzy and can hardly be said to denote a religion with a tradition of reflection about God, grace, and salvation. 
Portions of New Age are also Hinduism-inspired, causing some to exclaim New Age is simply Hinduism with a briefcase and business suit. Overall, the religiosity that emerges out of contemporary surveys matches better with Hinduism than with New Age, though New Age too is corroding traditional religions. As for Buddhism and Hinduism, there are numerous similarities between them, so much so that the Dalai Lama himself has called them twin brothers. Objectively considered, Hinduism, or more accurately, Brahmanism, which forms the core of modern Hinduism, may be said to be the mother or elder sister of Buddhism, since it existed at least a thousand years before Buddhism. And it has passed on its doctrinal and philosophical DNA to Buddhism through Gautama the Buddha, through Nagarjuna, the founder of the Madhyamaka school of Mahayana Buddhism, and through a stellar caste of Buddhist leaders who were all born and brought up Hindus and later converted to Buddhism. Despite the fact that the Buddha left Hinduism or Brahmanism, Hinduism has incorporated him into its own pantheon of divine incarnations. The Hindus believe in ten significant incarnations or avatars, from which we get the movie Avatar. Ten significant incarnations or avatars of the protector god Vishnu. Among them, some are animals and some are human. In many traditions, one of the ten incarnations is the Buddha, as you can see there, next to the right of the man on the horse. It's one of the incarnations of Vishnu, who is a Hindu god. Their doctrinal difference, differences notwithstanding, Buddhism and Hinduism have influenced each other over the centuries. What is noteworthy is Hinduism is an inclusive religion that has accommodated the Buddha. But Buddhism is not such an inclusive religion that can accommodate, not simply tolerate, or put up with Hinduism. Given the popularity of Buddhism in the United States and around the world, where in some countries like Australia, it is the fastest growing religion, one may be tempted to conclude that contemporary Christian trends reflect Buddhism rather than Hinduism. To do so, however, would be unwarranted. For what distinguishes Buddhism from Hinduism is its silence about Almighty God. Whereas what characterizes contemporary religiosity is people's belief in God. God does not have a place in Buddhism, even though Buddhists may acknowledge lower level gods, including some from the Hindu pantheon. In the words of the Dalai Lama, why did the Buddha not say anything about God? Because he talked about the law of causality. Once you accept the law of cause and effect, the implication is that there is no creator. If the Buddha accepted the concept of a creator, he would not have been silent. Everything would have been God. Many faithful Christians, including priests and nuns, practice Zen meditation and follow Buddhist ways. But from a Buddhist point of view, they may be seen merely as uncommitted drifters. Buddhism has no niche for monotheistic religion like Christianity, even though it may tolerate it. Neither can Christians commit themselves wholeheartedly to Buddhism or its practices without giving up their commitment to a personal God. It is this insight that leads Christian admirers of Buddhist techniques, like Jesuit Father William Johnston, author of several books on meditation and mysticism, including Zen mysticism, to be wary of committing themselves unreservedly to Buddhist practices like Zen. As Johnston has observed, 
The Zen practiced by eminent Christian exponents, like the Jesuit Father Enomia Lasalle, the one on the right side. He's a, that white priest there, he's one of the pioneers, perhaps the pioneer of Christian Zen into the West. Zen practiced by eminent Christian exponents like uh, Jesuit Father Enomia Lasalle, one of the pioneers of Christian Zen too, is generally held, in, held a suspect in the eyes of real Buddhist monks and masters. Buddhism seems definitely more popular than Hinduism in the West. Thanks to the high profile of the Dalai Lama and to the profound impact of its meditation practices and message of compassion. It appeals strongly to the increasing number of those who seek a spirituality without God, having found belief in God highly questionable or even unacceptable. On the other hand, it appeals only marginally to those who believe in God. No God believers adaptation of Buddhist practices can be entirely authentic either because of the incompatibility of belief in God with Buddhism. This is not to deny that modified Buddhist techniques, if not the theology, help many people to improve their physical and spiritual life. Now, Hinduism, on the other hand, is through and through a religion that acknowledges God, and it can enthusiastically approve of Christianity. Hinduism is much closer to Christianity than Buddhism. Belief in God makes Hinduism a treasure trove of devotional prayers, theological treatises, and mystical reflections, which can be adapted or even adopted entirely in total by Christians. You may recall that even Pope Benedict XVI cited a prayer from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, one of the ancient Vedic texts, and made references to the Hindu thinkers Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi in the Via Crucis, Way of the Cross, that he led at the Colosseum in spring 2009. A recent version of the Bible, compiled by a team of Indian scripture scholars with a full approval of Catholic bishops, includes a number of cross-references to Hindu scriptures. You might have seen in Christian Bibles cross-references to Old Testament and other Christian scriptures, but in India we have a Bible that cross-references to Hindu scriptures. The spirituality of Abhishek Tananda, Henry Lusseau, a French Dominican and the founder of Sakshidananda Ashram in India, Father Bede Griffiths, the one on the left, a British Benedictine and founder of the Shantivana Mashram in India, Father Ignatius Hridayam, an Indian Jesuit and founder of one of the very first interreligious dialogue centers in India, Blessed Mother Teresa, Raimon Panikar, a famous theologian of interreligious theology, Jesuit Father Anthony de Mello, spiritual author and the retreat master, and many pioneers of contemporary spirituality and interreligious dialogue is much indebted to Hinduism. The influence of yoga and transcendental meditation around the world is no less significant than that of Zen. Brought up to give short shrift to reincarnation, Christians may be shocked to learn that roughly one in four Americans believes in reincarnation. Yet, there are several parallels between reincarnation and purgatory. Reincarnation is, in essence, a period of atonement and purification for imperfect souls, and the release from it is achieved, as in the case of purgatory, only when the soul is purified. The karma, the reincarnation, the samsara is not eternal. The Hindus always have a hope. With God's help, they can get out of this cycle and be one with God. 
The reason Hindus speculated on reincarnation rather than on purgatory may have been their view of time, which was cyclical rather than linear as in Abrahamic religions. Given their cyclical view, Hindus seem to have found reincarnation the most probable means of purification just as Christians, given their linear view, seem to have found purgatory the most probable means of purification. The parallelism between the two beliefs is not far-fetched or contrived, for even the eminent theologian Karl Rahner speculated on the connection between reincarnation and uh, purgatory. My point here is not to encourage Christians to accept reincarnation, but simply to point out that the Hindus were well motivated and rational in their speculation of reincarnation. Just to be dogmatically correct in this assembly of many Jesuits, let me add, in his apostolic letter, Tertio Millennio Adveniente, Pope John Paul II explicitly stated that Christian revelation excludes reincarnation. At the International Symposium on Reincarnation and the Christian Message held at the Pontifical Gregorian University in 1999, Cardinal Paul Poupard recommended that priests and the catechists be so formed as to be able to convey the Christian message of hope better and thus reduce the temptation of Christians to opt for a belief in reincarnation. The Hindu theology of interreligious tolerance. Perhaps the most compelling reason for calling the current Christian trends Hinduism is the fact that the majority of Christians have come to acknowledge, as Hindus have done for ages, that theirs is not the only true religion, and that all conscientious seekers of truth can find the salvation regardless of their religion. An identifying feature of Abrahamic religions, by which I mean Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, has been their exclusive claims, each insisting that it is the sole guardian of truth or of God's revelations and the only means of salvation. At different periods of history, they have maintained that those who are not in their fold are doomed to perdition, that those who are not with them are against them, and that those who are in error have no rights. Islam and Christianity have also distinguished themselves in proselytizing activities, so much so that even their altruistic actions and conciliatory gestures have been alloyed with the ulterior motives of converting others. Astute critics, Hindu critics like Vivekananda, Mahatma Gandhi, Radhakrishnan, and Arun Shauri see elitism, arrogance, and duplicity in such magnanimity with a hook. Differing from the Abrahamic religions, Hinduism, the only other theistic alternative offers an inclusive theology of mutual acceptance by placing God rather than the beliefs or dogmas of any religion at the center. Put in Christian terms, Hinduism simply says, let us be united under the first commandment of Jesus Christ, to love God above all things, with all one's soul, with all one's mind, regardless of our differences in defining God. Hinduism demands from others neither an acceptance of its beliefs, for example, in God's karma and reincarnation, nor a rejection of their respective beliefs, for example, in the uniqueness of their respective prophets and saviors. As we cannot be united by what we have, the Hindus think, let us be united by what we seek, namely truth. 
God. From this perspective, one can appreciate the humility, sincerity, yearning, and the hope that are revealed in Gandhian utterances such as, I worship God as truth only. I have not yet found him, but I am seeking after him. Truth alone will endure. All the rest will be swept away. I must continue to bear testimony to truth even if I am forsaken by all. I believe many of you sincere Christians might have said something exactly the same, replacing truth with God. Hindus, Hindus affirm emphatically that God cannot be monopolized by any religion, including their own, and that God can ha save all conscientious seekers of truth regardless of their religion. As Mahatma Gandhi wrote, I came to the conclusion long ago that all religions were true and also that all had some error in them. And whilst I hold my own, I should hold others as dear as Hinduism. So we can only pray if you are Hindus, not that a Christian should become a Hindu. But our in innermost prayer should be a Hindu, should be a better Hindu. A Muslim, a better Muslim. A Christian, a better Christian. Although Christians did not look favorably upon such a theology of interreligious tolerance in former times, I myself have heard criticisms of these words before the Vatican Council from many priests. Nowadays, most seem to hold it as the surveys reveal. One can hear unambiguous echoes of it, for example, in the following words of Mother Teresa. There is only one God, and he is God to all. Therefore, it is important that everyone is seen as equal before God. I have always said we should help a Hindu become a better Hindu, a Muslim become a better Muslim, a Catholic become a better Catholic. You can see she has almost borrowed from Gandhi. If God can raise up children for Abraham out of stones, a Hindu might ask, can't he raise up children for himself from conscientious seekers of truth from other religions? Critics may legitimately point out numerous flaws in Hinduism. Most notably, its perpetuation of social evils such as casteism and its increasing intolerance. Hindus, Hinduism does not claim to be spotless, infallible, or free from errors as certain Abrahamic religions do. When even a religion with a hierarchical magisterium and a doctrinal watchdog cannot but acknowledge their sins and shortcomings. It is only natural that a religion without any such mechanism exhibits a variety of imperfections. In Christian terms, Hinduism excels in its concern to follow Jesus' first commandment to love God above all things, but fails dismally, miserably, in observing the second commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. Some of the severest critics of Hindu defects have been Hindus themselves, as may be seen in the life and writings of persons like Mahatma Gandhi. Other Hindu reformers, such as B.R. Ambedkar, who placed Hindus among those cruel people whose utterances and acts are two poles apart and embraced Buddhism, and Erod V. Ramasamy, this old man, who insulted Hinduism most of his life and died a proud atheist, have cataloged the long lists of Hindu sins and shortcomings. This man would go about making statues of Hindu gods and setting fire or urinating on them and so on, really humiliating Hindu gods and goddesses. However, 
the deviant behavior of its members does not invalidate the insights of a religion, and so the evils perpetrated in the name of Hinduism do not nullify the theology of interreligious tolerance. More damaging to Hinduism's identity as a religion of tolerance is the current wave of intolerance in India. As reported widely in August 2009, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, USCIRF, placed India on its watch list due to the disturbing increase in communal violence against religious minorities, which includes Muslims and the Christians also Sikhs. Much of this violence is attributed to the Saffron Brigade, groups belonging to a version of Hinduism that subscribes to the Hindutva, Hinduness ideology. Hindutva, he's the man who created the term or popularized it, conceived by a self-proclaimed atheist in the early 20th century, began as a political movement but is currently dominated by Hindu nationalists and Hindu supremacists. It emerged as a force to reckon with only in the 1990s, nurtured by politicians set on gaining power and exploit by exploiting religion. Paradoxically, these politicians model their ideology after the exclusive claims of Abrahamic religions and aim at giving back to Christians and Muslims some of their own medicine, which they dispensed when they held the political power many decades ago. The moderate success of Hindutva is due to several reasons, such as the lack of a persuasive secular politician, the absence of a moral leader like Mahatma Gandhi, and above all, the significant demographic changes. Looming as most alarming to the Hindus is the fact that the relative Hindu population of India has been declining and gradually and steadily. The population of Hindus, population of Hindus fell to 80% in 2001 from 85% in 1951, a fall of 5% in 50 years when the first national census was taken in free India. During the same 50-year period, the Hindu population in neighboring Bangladesh and Pakistan, which were Islamic countries with many Hindus, declined. The Hindus there were practically thrown out or they escaped. So the Hindu population there has decreased. Whereas the Muslim population in India rose from 9.7% in 1951 to 13.4% in 2001. The religious nationalism of Muslims in countries wherever they are the majority, the Buddhist nationalism of Sri Lanka, the status of Christianity as a state religion in several countries, and the fall of Hinduism as a state religion in Nepal have all contributed to the spread of Hindu extremism in India. It is noteworthy that India remains a secular state despite the fact that Hindus are the overwhelming majority and Hinduism is the only religion among the five major religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, the only religion not to have a country where its priorities and privileges are honored exceptionally. In spite of the rise of Hindutva, however, the Indian electorate, consisting mostly of Hindus, voted out the ruling pro-Hindutva party in 2004 from central government and elected the Liberal and Secular Congress party in two successive elections in 2004 and 2009. It is significant that the head of the ruling party whom the voting majority trusted is an Italian Catholic by birth, the lady on the left, and the Prime Minister of India is a Sikh, the man on the right, belonging to a non-Hindu minority religion. He belongs to Sikhism. She's officially Catholic, but we don't know whether she's practicing. It is India's Hindus themselves who put Intolerant, intolerant Hindus under check. 
and thus bear witness to the fundamental openness of Hinduism. Conclusion. Karl Rahner stirred up heated debates in the 1960s and 70s when he expounded his theory of anonymous Christians. Although from a Christian perspective it made sense to Christians, non-Christians found it offensive as it asserted the indispensability of Christianity while insinuating the inferiority and insufficiency of other religions. The current trend in the West may well be termed anonymous Hinduism. As most Christians don't acknowledge any connection with Hinduism, and yet, and are not even aware that their religious outlook they, is very similar to Hinduism. Anonymous Hinduism, of course, simply names the current situation without implying anything about the necessity of Hinduism for salvation. Unlike anonymous Christianity, which emphasizes the necessity of Christianity for salvation. Westerners seem to have a negative attitude towards Hinduism, presumably because they are turned off by the media's superficial reporting about idolatry, caste-based discrimination, dowry system, widow burning, urine drinking, and so on. This attitude may deter many from even considering the possibility that they are anonymous Christian, anonymous Hindus. Whether Christians recognize their proximity to Hinduism or not is more consequential to Christians than to Hindus. As Hinduism neither considers itself a missionary religion nor makes claims to possess any depositum fidei, a sacred deposit of faith, Hindus are happy as long as everyone ambles along towards truth to the best of their ability. The Hindu identity is not threatened by whether non-Hindus accept or reject their insights. Christians, however, face the challenge of how to reconcile their long-held beliefs with the recalcitrant attitudes of their own faithful. It is Christian identity defined for centuries in terms of Christ's uniqueness and the church's exclusive status that is threatened by the ordinary Christian's rejection of such doctrines. Miller's provocative assertion, therefore, must prod Christians to reflect in what sense they are different when a large number of them concur with the basic Hindu tenets. Missionaries in Asia especially face the arduous task of explaining why Asia needs Christ and Christianity when Christians in the West are looking to the East for religious and spiritual insights. That's the end of my paper. Thank you very much for listening.